right. I see that Nancy Stolman has made it in safely. Hi, Nancy. Can you hear me okay? Hello, how are you? I'm doing I can. Well. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. I'm sorry about the uh, lag that we have going on here at the house. It's just one of those days. No doesn't look like video was going to work. I didn't do my hair. So. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just going to stop my video and we'll just stay with the audio recording. So for everybody that is going to be listening after I process and upload this, I am interviewing Nancy Stolman today. We are here again on Mythical Minstrelsies and Flash Fiction Fridays. I'm your host, Teresa Amehana Garcia, or Amehana Arashi, depending where you find me from. Nancy is the author of six books, including Going Short, an invitation to flash fiction and her most recent book which is after the rapture and so to start off with besides the information from your wonderful bio what can you tell us about yourself that we can't find on there Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I've been writing since I was about 25. Um, seriously, I've been writing, obviously, since I was a child, um, writing and reading. And I've been writing seriously since I was about 25. And I discovered flash fiction uh, about 15 years ago, when I was in grad school initially. And flash fiction really changed everything for me, because prior to um, discovering flash fiction, I was writing traditional novels, basically. Like I read traditional novels. I love novels. Um, I just assumed that that's what I would be writing was novels. And so I was writing novels. I wrote multiple novels, which I call now my, lovingly call them my practice novels. And uh, when I discovered flash fiction in grad school, it was like worlds collided for me. And suddenly everything that I had been doing in my novel writing, um, just, uh, uh, I saw everything through a new lens. So suddenly, you know, I wanted to cut half of the things that were in my novel and shrink everything down and look at things differently. And, um, and that's really how I've come to what I call a flash novel, which is what After the Rapture is. Um, it's really kind of the, the, the love child of the novel and flash fiction. So you came to writing a little bit differently than I did then. I came in with uh, short form short stories, but not flash fiction and micro fiction. And that was back when I was in school. So it's really interesting to have you on the show to be able to talk about these so that other people can get into writing and understand more about you. Um getting on to your current yeah, and I, I think some people come to flash fiction oh go ahead i was just gonna say i think that some people come to flash fiction <laughs> sorry i think we're having a little lag um i think some people come to flash fiction from long form like i did some people come from poetry you know so there's kind of an inherent short uh, affinity to short but maybe having to learn narrative uh, or practice a little more narrative. And then I, I think it's wonderful when somebody like you is coming right in, in a short form, you know, and then just refining that. Um, I find that fascinating. There's definitely a lot of different ways to write a story. And I'm so glad that you brought up poetry because so many people that I have talked to in my life really like to write, but don't feel that they can write a story and yet they can write a poem and they have the confidence to do that. Um, I guess that brings us into our next question. Yeah. Uh, where do you find your inspiration and especially for this story? Mm -hmm. Everywhere, <laughs> all over. I think once I'm in a book and and always I'm happiest when I'm in a book, when I'm inside of a, of a longer project. So in those times between a book, um, I feel a little lost, you know, but always when I'm in a book, um, 
I'm pretty much living that book all the time. So inspiration comes from everything. It comes from uh, personal experiences I might be having. It could be um, uh, like social, you know, experiences that people are having society wide. Um, it could be a weird thing I read. It could be a friend's experience. Um, once I'm in the middle of a book, you know, all all bets are off and anything is game uh, to become part of my inspiration. So with this particular book, um, I would say there were two major sources that I was drawing on. One was the political landscape, right? Well, maybe three. Um, one was the political landscape and just, to me, this sort of satirical nature of reality, because at some point, which is something I'm pushing a lot in this book, you know, reality becomes the satire, you know, and suddenly you're, you can't see the difference between the satire and what's actually happening. And I think that um, satire well-written may have that kind of built into its DNA that eventually it may find itself coming to pass. So a lot of just the the craziness of what was happening in society. And remember that I wrote this uh, book before the pandemic. So everything that I wrote was pre-pandemic, although, you know, as a person writing satire, you're, you're always sort of casting yourself into the future, into the like, ridiculous what ifs like if I could push this into ridiculous where would that land us and then so much of that actually started coming true when the pandemic was happening so um so that was a big source of inspiration um my own personal uh I was hit by a car uh, about six or seven years ago and that's kind of where the whole Barbie trope kind of came from because uh, I was hit by this car, a drunk driver, by the way, I was seatbelt on within the speed limit daytime and um, a drunk driver on a suspended license hit me um, almost head on. He crossed the median and hit me. So, um, so please don't drink and drive. And, uh, uh, but I, sh I was very lucky to survive at all and to survive, you know, with, with my body intact. So, um, but in the healing process, I was, you know, really watching my body kind of heal outside of myself. So I had this arm, it started with the arm that wouldn't move right, which I affectionately started calling my Barbie arm. And then just all these things, you know, glass coming out of my body and, and, you know, all the weirdness that, uh, that sort of spawned this idea of this Barbie character who was having things happen to her, you know, that was sort of out of her control. And she, is uh, sort of becoming a Barbie throughout the story, but uh, but it's all happening to her. There's no real agency happening. Um, so that was huge, you know, really personal source of, of inspiration. And then, um, you know, some biblical, I didn't really do too much biblical research, but, um, you know, I was raised uh, Catholic. So I'm familiar with you know, the biblical stories. And I've always been fascinated by the, the high drama of so much of the biblical stories um i've i've addressed kind of the high drama of biblical stories in other of my books and so just playing with the rapture as just an any number of these events that the people are waiting for you know like the the y2ks and the end of the mayan calendars and and you know all these these sort of events that we're always waiting for and then they pass and then now we have to wait for another one. So I was really kind of drawing from those three places um, largely. That sounds a lot like uh, what happened with me and my back, actually. So I'm actually really glad that you wrote about the Barbie trope, because for me, it resonated a lot when my children were very, very, very extremely small. I used to be a housekeeper and that's how I blew out a couple discs in my back and dislocated my hip and getting everything put back together kind of messed up my nerves and I still have problems with that to this day so for me it hit home quite a lot because I definitely feel pretty plastic some days and I think a lot of other readers uh, can really identify with that Yeah, I love that you say that because, 
you know, it wasn't something I was consciously thinking. And I, and I think the best writing is that which communicates something beyond what you were just initially intending, but, but kind of makes its own friends out in the world. And, and as the story started to keep arriving, it was like, of course, you know, the plastic of, of society. And of course, Barbie would be the perfect spokesperson for that on some level. And so even though it happened really organic for me to, to come to a Barbie-like character, um, it couldn't have been more perfect when I got to the end and, and looked back on what had happened in the story. So Barbie was obviously going to be in there in some fiction some fiction, some fiction, of course, some fashion. I haven't had a whole lot of coffee today. I hope it isn't showing too badly. So um, did you have to worry about any legal aspects of it when you were compiling all your little splash pieces? Did you have to consult a lawyer or anything like that? Because I know that's something that keeps a lot of people from writing. No. I think, um, you know, if you're using something for parody or satire, then um, that's and, and it's pretty obvious that that's what you're doing, then it's not usually an issue that needs to go through a lawyer. I mean, Saturday Night Live is doing it all the time. Um, I think it just has to be very clear that it is satirical or being used for comic effect. Um uh, so no, I, I'm not, if I was, if, if I had a Barbie character that was, that I was using very seriously without any kind of comic flavor to it at all, and possibly, you know, um, and, and somebody would read it without getting the humor at all. And, and Barbie was potentially, I don't know, killing people or something, you know, um, I, I think that the, the Barbie, uh, foundation might be a little more upset but um no i think with parody and with satire as long as it's pretty clear that that's what you're doing then you're usually okay thank you for clarifying that for a lot more people than i've talked with directly but i know that it is a big question mm -hmm. always for people so um what's your favorite part of this book what was your favorite piece to write hmm. I mean there's many I really love the opening piece the bad thing that that was one of those delicious pieces that arrived almost intact I barely had to do any kind of editing to that one and just sort of came in that like inspired gush which we're always hoping for the inspired gush but we don't always get it uh so I I loved that piece and it was really um, in the moment that I wrote it. And again, when people read it now, they're going to think about the pandemic and all sorts of things, but I, I wrote it pre-pandemic. You know, so I was thinking more about things like school shootings and, um, you know, I think I wrote it in 2015 even. So um, at the time I felt like I, I captured exactly my frustration with the way that people were handling this like onslaught of, of pain and it continues. I mean, everything I wrote just continues, you know, I think that, and, and we do become desensitized to it, but um, you know, there's this onslaught of pain, things are bad, then things are worse, then things are even worse. Then the new bad thing is competing with the worst bad thing and which bad thing is the worst. And, and now we don't like the people who don't like the bad thing that we think is worse. And now we're mad at people for not mourning the way we are. And, and just kind of all of that, I think I was able to really capture it. Um, and so I love that piece. Um, I love a lot of like just the funny humorous pieces, you know, the, the pilgrimage to the original Kentucky Fried Chicken and, and the Barbie house and all the little Barbie advertisements throughout. Um, and then the ending was really special to me. I wrote it. Um, I was, I had taken myself kind of on a solo writing retreat um, in Arizona. I had rented a little house for a week and I was there just to kind of get the ending right. And um, so, you know, I was alone 
listening to coyotes, watching the sunrise and set, not really talking to anybody. And I really kind of went into this dreamy state. And um, that's how I kind of got the ending in place. So um, yeah, uh, they're, they're all special to me in different ways. It's always hard to choose between the children, isn't it? Okay. Now my connection has stabilized somewhat again. Um, do you feel that this story is going to be able to cross cultures in order to be appreciated globally? I mean, I know that Christianity is all around the world, but there are still people that function within different cultural paradigms to our own. So what do you think? Well, I definitely don't consider it a Christian book at all. Um, I don't know that Christians would like it. <laughs> if they're really Christian, they probably wouldn't like it. If you're reading this book because you're a Christian and want to read about the rapture, that is the wrong reason to read this book. You know, that is not what this book is doing. Um, this is a this is a book of of satirical literary fiction, you know. So um, I'm playing with pop culture. I'm playing with, you know, extremes. I'm I'm poking fun at many, 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 many things. So um, not a Christian book. Um, and, you know, it's very much a, a product, I think, of, of now. You know, a lot of these pop culture references are uh, largely American references. Um, although, you know, American culture is a, an export for the world at this point. So probably many of those are going to be familiar, but, but I'm referencing very American things, you know, from, from Barbie to Kentucky fried chicken, you know, to, um, I do have a couple of things, you know, that are, that are not necessarily fully American. I talk about Loch Ness at one point. Um, but no, I'm really writing from my experience as, uh, you know, a modern pop literature, um, American writer, you know, who's, who's, immersed in a consumerism culture um who's immersed in commercialism um who you know hollywood is our our religion and our gods um and the media is our you know um uh, teacher and so i think it, i think anybody can appreciate it if you can appreciate it on that level um i'm not necessarily trying to change the world nor thinking that this is going to um, speak to every person on the planet but i do think the people it does speak to are going to really find a kinship in in like the absurdity that i am able to put my finger on that's going to be very familiar because i think we're all familiar with the absurdity that's happened to our society and and it keeps getting more and more absurd um so i i mean i think a lot about that movie and i think it's from 2006 idiocracy oh yeah. it's one of those movies that when it came out in yeah when it came out in 2006 we're like that's hilarious and so far-fetched we couldn't even imagine it happening you know and 20 years later how many times have I thought, wow, we're closer to idiocracy than I ever thought we would ever be, you know? So I feel like this book is more along those lines, but, but coming from less of a straight comedy and much more of like a nuanced, dark, sat satirical humor, um, much more of a poetic bent to it. So do you think it's going to get to spread more around the world than you anticipate, maybe? What do you think is going to happen? I don't know. You know. I don't know. And I think it's okay that I don't know, because I think, you know, when you, when you make a piece of art, any kind of artifact, and you put it into the world it's no longer yours, you know, like it belongs to everybody. And so really I can speak to it. I can speak to my feelings about it. I can speak to how it became, but at this point, it's no longer mine. You know, at this point it's out there making friends and who knows what's going to happen to it. I mean, I, 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 I don't even want to predict because um, any number of things could happen, but 
I really feel like at this point, the the book has its own trajectory. It has its own um, purpose and its own path. And I am going to be cheering it on and and celebrating and all the things, but but it's not really mine anymore to manipulate. That sounds very like a conversation I recently had with my now adult son about some of the uh, things that he likes to read and watch and how I can't really remember exactly how the conversation went, but it sounded a lot like what you had to say about your own work here. So I find that comforting in that I was guiding him down the correct path because there have been people that have been disagreeing with me on what I think happens with people's books once they go into the world. Well, and I think, you know, it's it's natural for the creator of anything to kind of have an ego investment in what happens to it. You know, we want it to land a certain way. We want people to think a certain thing about it. Um, But it's also sort of like, if I were to say, well, I want everybody to, you know, think about me in a certain way, you know, like, and if you don't see me the way I want you to see me, I'm going to come over to your house and change your mind. It's like, you know, people's opinions of me are none of my business and people's opinions of my book are really none of my business either because I'm done with the writing part of it. Like the book is now its own thing. I'm, I'm not going to rewrite it. I'm certainly not going to, you know, make another version to make somebody happy. Uh, so, so for me, I think um, one of the most important things we can do as creatives is remember our true position in the creative process, which is like midwife, to the art, but not the genius. Like as soon as we think we're the genius, then we have to follow our art around and make sure everybody sees it the right way, you know? But once we kind of take that step back and remember, you know, the humility of like, you know, art chooses us, I think it comes through us. And if we are lucky enough to be available when a piece of art comes through, then, you know, awesome but uh, as soon as we start thinking that we're in charge of that I think that's when the problems start I think so too and I do not want to follow my own work around that would be murder I think I have enough no, no. Cats. um so um <laughs> you wrote within the mainstream U.S. culture would you consider work with something within other religio mythical frameworks what what is the future for you in your writing mm. well the project i'm working on now does draw a lot from greek mythology so there's that um also draws a lot from tarot so there's that so i'm kind of putting together like greek mythology and tarot a bit and um and also draws on like midwestern gothic kind of tropes um so yeah the 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 collision of those three things um playing together we'll see what happens i'm i'm about i don't know 75 pages into it and it's at that spot where i'm like i'm not exactly sure what's happening here um so yeah i mean i think for me like whatever arrives that feels like it's got a lot of heat to it that feels juicy that feels like it's speaking to me Um, I'm always, I'm always excited to play in. I think what I wouldn't consider is doing something because it's fashionable or it's a trend or it seems to be hot or, you know, everybody's wanting this right now. Um, that doesn't really speak to me. It really has to kind of bubble up organically from what is interesting to me at that moment in time. And like, what am I personally processing and composting emotionally that needs to find soil. So what is your writing routine then? What, how do you get going? Yeah, I um, I write most mornings, uh, first thing in the morning with coffee by hand. So that's been my routine for a long time. I get up I make the coffee and uh, I write in my notebook by hand. 
uh, for an hour or two. And I, I like to do it in bed, you know, as long as I'm not waking other people up. Um, I like to sit in bed with my coffee and write. I really appreciate being in that liminal space where I haven't really started engaging with the world yet. I haven't checked texts and checked emails and started thinking about the day, but I'm very much like in that dreamy space. So um, an hour or two of that every morning is is a beautiful way for me to start my day. And then I kind of engage with the world and do my things and answer the emails and run the businesses and teach the classes and all the things. And then ideally, um, I get to have a second writing chunk that happens in the later afternoon. So maybe like three to five. Um, yeah, two or three to five or six, somewhere in there. And that's where I will work on the computer. So that's when I will type up maybe what I was writing by hand in the morning. Um, I'll revisit the things that I've already been working on. That's where I'm much more in, I would say like editing brain as opposed to creative generating brain. Um, and I try to write in bed again. I have a lap desk and I bring my computer to the bed. I, I don't like to write at my desk because my desk is where I work and do the work work things. And for me, the, like I need my feet off the ground when I'm in creative mode, whether it's the morning or the afternoon. So that, that's kind of my ideal day. And I get to do that quite often. Um, sometimes I'll spend like a whole weekend, you know, just um, on the computer doing that sort of editing. Um, but yeah, I really like to have those two different types of writing time that are very different for me. Um, but they, they work together. It's like I generate in the morning, I, I fix it in the afternoon and, you know, if I can do that every day, that's a beautiful day. That makes a lot of sense to me because that's the way my brain works too. And if I have to go back and forth between them, I can literally feel that little divide in the center of the brain just like snap and it's not a fun feeling yep. mm -hmm. well, um, as a reader what is your favorite thing to read mm -hmm. i mean i love novels um i read novels before bed um, i try not to read a lot of flash fiction before bed because it winds me up you know it's like you're going from like peak to peak to peak. And, and so if I try to read flash fiction before bed, I may have eight peaks, you know, and, and then I can't sleep. So um, I pretty much read novels before bed or sometimes nonfiction. Um, I love like a weird book. I love a surreal book. I love magical realism. I love um, kind of classic literature, Not not necessarily like uh, 1700s type literature, but but I love things, you know, like 1900s kind of classic literature. I reread um, Hemingway often. I reread um, Garcia Marquez often. Um, I love The Virgin Suicides. It's one of my favorite books. I, I like things that are really lyrical and weird, like uh, beautiful and lyrical and weird. Um, I love the book, um, Woman in the Dunes is a Japanese writer. Um, it's weird and lyrical. Um, I'm rereading um, Never Let Me Go, which is kind of a dystopic um, uh, book. I like Margaret Atwood, Handmaid's, Handmaid's Tales. An amazing book, 1984. Amazing book. Um, I like Lolita. It's, it's extremely lyrical and beautiful and weird and like disturbing, you know, a little disturbing is okay with me. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I land often. I'm going to have to look for some of those, especially that Woman of the Dunes. I love Japanese writing, but I've not heard of that book yet. So that's going to be a fun. So good. Um. We are almost done with the expected time. Um, I don't think this is going to cut off on us. That's good. Um, so it, your bio says you're a professor. Since we're now in the wing it time frame, um, what can you tell us about being a professor? <laughs> 
Uh, I have been a professor for about 15 years now. Um, I started teaching at community colleges. I now teach at the University of Colorado Boulder. And so I've, I've worked with a lot of different demographics of students, um, some of them non-traditional to traditional. I've taught, you know, the intro level comps and creative writings. I've taught upper division um, creative writing and, and different sort of writing um, classes. I've been a thesis advisor for graduate thesis um, students in all fields. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting because I have a, I have a 17 year old son. He's going to be graduating from high school in two months. And I have a daughter who's 25 and she, neither of my children have gone like the traditional college route. And I think it's, I think they've, they've seen behind the curtain with me a little bit, you know? And so I guess one of the things I think about as a, as a professor is that like college is this really rich opportunity to like deepen one's thinking and to um, widen one's exposure to all sorts of texts and ideas and thinkers and art. And um, it's, it's really a rich and magical place to me. And I think sometimes today, you know, we've reduced college to like um, a precursor to getting a good job, you know, but we're going to like you know, punch our, punch our college time clock. And, and then we're going to get some sort of great job. And we're just going to focus on, you know, like our track so that we can get our like job. And, and, you know, I feel like that's, that we're missing what I think college can and should be, which is this like really rich experience of, of intellectual and artistic and, and philosophical sharing. And, and we don't often in life get a whole period of, of time in which we get to be immersed in um, thought and sharing and trying and risk and learning. And so I guess, you know, that's the thing that I that I see the most in my classes and, and that I, you know, miss from my own studenthood was is that feeling of like wonder of being in this sort of. Uh, academic community and getting to partake in that. So um, I guess that's what I would say is that, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on the grades and on the, you know, you're in the same wing it and you know, the midterms and the finals and, and, you know, and the getting it right and getting the job and the right blah, blah, and this and that. And, and that's all true. And I just hope that people don't forget like the the essence the like the seed the germ of the whole thing as bureauc as much you know bureaucracy as there can be in academia um i still think it's a good idea well thank you very much for sharing that i hope that those of you that have been thinking that there's no use in college have been listening extremely closely children merlin athena I'm looking at you kids. Um, so thank you again, Nancy, for coming on air with us. Um, everybody that's listening, please check her out. You can find her at nancystolman.com. That's N-A-N-C-Y-S-T-O-H-L-M-A-N.com. And you can find her also on Facebook. She's got her own YouTube very useful videos up there she's on twitter and she is also on uh, flashfictionretreats.com as well so um thank you very much for this opportunity for our fun little chat and i'm sorry that my video is not working as yes. well as i was hoping it was such a pleasure to be here Teresa. thanks so much for having me we will be staying in touch because I would like very much to hear what else happens with her career. So this has been Mythical Minstrelsy mm -hmm. and Flash Fiction Fridays. I have been your host, Teresa Amehana Garcia or Amehana Arashi, as always making myself sound like a doofus, but that's okay because we also have fun on here too. Bye, Nancy. Thank you again.
Bye.